What you're about to see here is a conversation that I had with Nance, Mikey, and Todd McGowan. I think at the beginning of January, uh, 2024, basically we were doing an epic marathon live stream, which is where I started at like five in the morning and went all until like, I think 7 PM my time. And we had so many amazing guests on throughout the day, but, uh, we brought Todd on at a special point in the marathon because I always plan these things out so that, um, the, there's like a, a thread or multiple threads of various topics. Uh, and we're going to bring them through different speakers and interviewees, uh, for, for the continuity and the contrast. And, uh, this was Deleuze's birthday. And so after having talked to some Deleuzeans, it's fantastic to have Todd McGowan, a Lacanian on, for those who don't know, Jacques Lacan versus Guy Deleuze. It's a big division in the theory scene today. And something I personally find fascinating because there's lots of really cool ideas in both of those thinkers. Uh, but yeah, some, for some people it's like never again shall the twain meet and you know how we are, we're like kind of all over the place. Uh, and we think there's a lot to learn from everybody. And so, uh, I think if you, if you are interested in either Deleuze or Lacan, you're going to find this an especially interesting conversation. And with that, I'm about to play it, but I do want to encourage you to stick around until the end, uh, where you will get to hear all about what's going on with Theory Underground, what Theory Underground is, and how to get involved. Thank you. Oh yeah, like, comment, subscribe. We're live. Welcome everybody to the show. This is Theory Underground. I'm David McCarricker. The co-host is Nance, and I, I mean, Mikey's kind of like a co, co-host, I don't know, like, but, but also it's just kind of like the two of us wanted to talk to you two, but the three of us wanted to talk to you, Todd, and so we're joined today by Todd McGowan, so great to have you back, man, how you doing? Great to see you, David. Uh, so, I don't know if you know too much about uh, what's been going on today uh, with the the stream here. No, you've not been. No, I mean, I kind of, you gave me a vague idea, but I'm not exactly sure what you're doing. So, okay. Well, uh, you I told me a I lot of the people that were going to come on, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I woke up at like five 30, you know, or, you know, four 30 AM and, uh, and just started preparing and I've just been going, 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 going. And now we're kind of getting into grand finale territory here. And so uh, okay. We're, we're kind of coming off of all of that. Uh, Mikey, were you able to catch any of that live? Yeah, I watch, I would say 90% of the stream. That's awesome. I had a route, That's awesome. I had a route today, so I was able to watch Yeah, the, the majority of it. Alenka, cool. Brent Atkins, uh, Ashley, uh, Christine. Who am I? Am I missing somebody else? Daniel Gardner. And I, I, Daniel's the one I saw half of his, but then I was at a stop and I was supposed to pick up some batteries and exchange. They ordered D or C batteries. We brought them D, blah, blah, blah. It took them 35 minutes to find the batteries in the warehouse. And so I couldn't watch during those 35 minutes. Uh, so that was a big chunk of Daniel. But that's uh, a really no, good I chunk, mean, too. Yeah, but but uh, another great stream so far. Um, I really wish I had a chance uh, to talk to Brent Atkins. Um, Cause again, like, I mean, though I'm this, I'm on the Lacanian Zizekian side, Brent it, it wrote one of the best, if not the best intros to DNG that I've read so far. Um, I'm not going to be, you know, qu quiet when it comes to the fact that a lot of the secondary material on DNG doesn't help very much. A lot of times it actually confuses the situation more. Um, I I don't think I've said it to you before. Uh, Brent's done an incredible job of of opening up the world of DNG in a way because, you know, we, we use our examples. Hubert Dreyfus did for Heidegger, you know, this this great service of even if we we disagree with Hu uh, Hubert on certain interpretations, he opened up the world um 
of Heidegger Force. Todd did that with Lacan and Zizek for all of us. Um, so there's there's been people who come along and they have the ability to so clearly and systematically explain um, th these these matrices of concepts, right? Um, Brent Brent's taken this huge step forward in making D and G a lot more accessible. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was really great. Um, I actually have a question for Todd, um, based Same. on something Brent said. Um, Same. and so, you know, I mean, part of it, Todd is like, we're at this point where we want to bring in more Deleuzians. We want to have these discussions about Lacan versus Deleuze on desire and all of these, you know, things are, are they compatible? I mean, I think I've heard you say, well, no, you kind of have to choose between D, D and G and Han and Zizek. And then Brent says, no, he, he kind of does the Deleuzian thing. If you can find a creative way of connecting D and G to Lacan, then do that. I don't, I mean, it, I, I framed it like, can we square this circle? And look, and the, at the most fundamental level of systematic ontology, I don't think we can square the circle. Um, are there interesting ways to, you know, could, could we find ways to connect OJ to a body without a work? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, but the question is like, are, are the metaphysics as a whole, uh, reconcilable? I, I know how you feel about that, but mm -hmm. the point is we want to have these, these discussions to better understand both sides of this equation and to better understand desire. I mean, Brent today, you know, De Deluzo Guattarians are going to use this example, especially with kids where little, little young children, um, th they have a kind of spontaneous sporadic joy in testing out things, right? Making connections to the world. It's not because they're filled with lack and they're trying to fill the unfillable void. It's a kind of spontaneous enjoyment in just connecting to the world, testing things out. And so they'll say, well, see, that's desiring production. This is this pure positivity of desire. It's not rooted in lack. Um, but then at the same time, we have Freud's grandson yeah. with Fort Daw. And so, uh, which, of course, is it, this this whole thing of trying to cope with lack and master lack or understand lack in a, in a way, right? And so to what I would say to Brent is like, okay, what you, I understand what you guys are doing when you appeal to these activities kids do. They do. They're, they're real curious and just want to try things out. Right. But they're also fundamentally concerned with the absence of the mother, uh, the absence of the father. And it's not just social coding. Their very well being depends on these people at a fundamental level. They cannot survive on their own. And so the smallest of children are concerned with the absence of the primary caregiver. And if D and G think they're going to get, they're going to neutralize desire as lack simply because they, you can point to these examples where kids are real affirmative in a kind of Nietzschean way, life affirmative. To, oh, let me try this. Let me do this. Yeah. But there's other issues with desire at that same stage of desire that, those examples don't undermine and you can just to, to privilege it and go see this is primary lack is derivative i just think that's an arbitrary selection of what you want to privilege but okay i'll shut up now uh okay should, you want me to respond to that so okay uh i didn't i didn't know if there was a question there or not um uh, yeah yeah so let me just. I'll, I'll, I'll just, just say it. I, I didn't even ask my question, so there. Okay, there right. we'll, so, we'll, we'll circle I'll back. Around. I, 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 I also, I also yeah, have, okay. I also have uh, a question that I'll want to ask in relation to Brent Atkins. But before we we get to our questions, you will of course say your thing here. But I also just wanted to say really quick that it is the birthday of Deleuze today. So it's Deleuze's birthday. So. You know, hats off to Deleuze. That's why we thought we, if we're ever going to bring on Brent Adkins, it'd be really cool to do it on the day that, you know, it's his birthday. And so, so happy birthday to the ghost of Deleuze. Um, now let's go ahead and tear into him. How old would he be, David? Uh, 46. Would he be, would he be how much? <laughs> I, said, I said 46. I was, I was just, I'm joking. No, but would he be, is he, I mean, could he conceivably be alive? I think he could. I think he'd be a hundred or so, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, he he could. I mean, 
he he wasn't so much older than Badu, was he? Uh, he was only seventy or so when he died. He died in what ninety three something. Uh, so yeah, he could. He, 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 was, he was born in nineteen twenty five. So he'd be ninety. You know, Levi Strauss. He lived to be one hundred and two or three or something. So it is possible. Um, yeah. So I don't want to pick on Deleuze on his birthday. That seems terrible. But let me just give. This whole spontaneous uh, vitality of the child, right? So let me just give a counterexample. So, and, and I'm going to give an example of an animal since the Liz is, thinks we should all try to become animal. Uh, so our cat, maybe I know, David, you have a cat too. Our cat's favorite thing to do is take these little, you know, like a twisty that you twist around. It's like a thing that keeps a wrapper closed, but you twist it around your finger and then you throw it and the cat likes to go chase it and then bring it back to you. But even more than bring it back, the cat likes to play with it and push it under the couch. And it probably has like 25 twisties under our couch. And so my question is, why does the spontaneous vitality involve I get your point, Mikey, about there's this back symbolic background of the spontaneous vitality. And I think that's very important, obviously. But why does the spontaneous vitality involve? And I think kids do the same thing. That's what the cat is, is just uh, uh, incidental. Uh, why why is the spontaneous vitality involved putting the thing out of sight, right? Like like the Freud example of the like why put the thing away? Why put why say da right like i think that that to me that's or why make it da uh to me that's like the whole the whole or for it i guess is what it's called uh i i i guess to me that's the whole question of the of the of the spontaneous vitality right like why what role does regardless of lack or whatever like but what role does absence play in that vitality and i think it plays i think just as such a crucial role because if the world was full i just don't think there would be a vital response to it like i think part of what we see in that vitality is a a way to create something to desire right and if you if you have everything present then i think there's it's, it's suffocating for desire. So I, I think that to me is like a, would be my first response to that image of the child being, having this kind of imminent vitality. Like, I just don't think that, I think that that vitality requires something missing. And if it doesn't have something missing, it's going to forge something. missing. And I think that's the, to me that I don't, I, I've never, I am just to be empirical. Like I've never seen an example of that not being true. Like even like the child is concerned with what doesn't seem to work, right? What, what, like what, like doesn't make sense within its symbolic universe. And that's what it has. uh, Yeah. Okay. It has a lot of seemingly spontaneous interest in that, but it's not, it's not in what's just working out perfectly fine. I, I, it seems to me. Fantastic. So, uh, Mikey, do you, do you want to ask your question then? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have two questions for Todd. I want to get to, um, the, since we're, we're kind of pivoting off of the discussion with Brent Atkins earlier, um, Todd, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read his book, but there's a book that he, he wrote that's been on my radar for a long time. I always wanted to get around to it. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't, but it's um what's it called death and desire um heidegger hegel heidegger hegel and deleuze it's basically heidegger hegel and deleuze on desire and death sign me up i'm there for that um (laughs) what what brent ultimately argues uh he starts off with this antinomy as he puts it uh between Heidegger and Hegel on death. He says that Heidegger, for, for Heidegger, death is this radically individualizing thing. Being towards death is my own most possibility because it's the possibility of me losing all of the, my possibilities, which are rooted in my singular facticity, right, et cetera. Okay, so death is individualizing for Heidegger. 
He says, for Hegel, death is a fundamentally communal event. Um, part of me wanted to just ask you what you think of that. Um, and then what he, he, because this was originally his dissertation, he only had Hegel and Heidegger in it. He wasn't really happy with it. When he discovered Deleuze, he found a way of, of getting outside of both Hegel and Heidegger because Deleuze is the philosopher of positivity. He thinks that ultimately for Heidegger and Hegel, death is fundamentally related to lack. And so you can do something else with death if you're a positivist in the Deleuzean sense. Mm -hmm. And so he found something out. But I, I mean, primarily, I'm just interested if you think that there is a kind of contradiction or antagonism between Heidegger and Hegel on death. And if you think it is right to say that for Hegel, death is fundamentally of communal relevance instead of it being some individualizing thing. Yeah, I, I've, I actually have read that. Our, our, our little theory group at UVM did that book. So um, what I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't agree with that. So I think that, I mean, I, I think that Heidegger and Hegel have, have different views on death for sure. But, but it's interesting because when I first read the, t I read the two of them together over a summer for the first time. And I thought, well, they just have the same, their position's exactly the same about our relation to death. And I think that's wrong, but I did, that was my first reaction. Um, but I don't think that, I don't think that death for Hegel is collective. Like, I think it's, I think there's something, uh, it's individual in a way that it's that it's different for Heidegger because for for Hegel I think death is what you know he calls death the absolute master right like and I think as the as the absolute master it's what do, it's what interrupts the collectivity for him and I think I mean that's what Heidegger likes about death right like death in, in anticipation towards death individualizes Dasein down to itself right like it, that. That, that for Heidegger, that's really, at least the Heidegger of design and sight, that's the really the key, that's what makes it philosophically valuable, is that it's it's not, like... It breaks you out of the Dossmann, right? Right, right, like, 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 right. In the public, one dies, but death is always this individualizing experience for, for, for Dasein, right? And, and, and that's what Dossmann tries to, to tranquilize us about. But I mean that 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 I think is not Hegel's position. But I think he does see that, like that that um, death is what we have to confront to to do anything, right? Like I think that that's. I mean, I think in a way that's one of the main takeaways of the. I think people make too much of the master servant dialectic i think that gets way way overblown just because i think it's just a contingent fact that it's some of hegel's it's his best little story it's his best little you know writing and so people fit, they glom onto it and then of course kojev's influence is incredible in that in that light but i i think it gets but i think one of the good takeaways of that is that this confrontation with death which the only the servant has I think that often gets misread too. Like people often say, oh, Hegel's point is you can't really be a person unless you have this, unless you, you brave death like the master does. And this, but no, his point is the master is actually wrong because the master thinks I'm going to brave death. And because there's something about me that will survive my death, like whatever, the, my recognition of my identity as, as someone, a figure of mastery. But Hegel's point, when he calls death the absolute master, his point is, that's not true. Like, there's a real, I think, existentialist flavor to what Hegel's saying. That is, once you die, that's it. And then he thinks that the servant has a understanding of that because the servant's like, look, I'm in this struggle for, struggle for life, and I'm going to, or struggle for recognition to the death. I give up before I die because I understand that death is that that's it. It's the absolute end. And recognition is meaningless if you are dead. And the master doesn't think that. And so for, Hey, I think that, and so I think that's the, in a way that insight is the ground of everything that comes after. So that's a way early in self-consciousness, right? So everything that comes after 
in the phenomenology. And I think all of Hegel's philosophy has its basis in that real insight about that our infinitude has to come out of this real grasp of our confrontation with death, right? Like he, like I think Hegel gets wrongly thought of as a philosopher of the infinite who disdains death. But that is, I think that is absolutely wrong. I think it's through this recognition of the of death as absolute master that the one then comes to our infinitude. So I don't, I don't, yeah. So I, I think that I, I wouldn't call that collective. Right. Like, that's the only thing I would. But I think it's right. Oh, no. Let me ask you this, because we all know if you want to know what Heidegger thinks about death or being towards death, you go to chapter one of division two of being in time. Correct. Hegel. I mean, I guess this is weird. Right. I guess I don't think of Hegel having like a, a big original theory of death. Because if if we're talk if we're just talking about what he says about death in the master slave dialectic portion of the phenomenology, I mean, okay, I I guess we could say that, but it's almost like what you're doing. You're almost extrapolating a theory of death. I mean, is that what we're working with? Is the master slave dialectic, or well, is, also the preface, the preface, and the preface, okay, right, right the preface, because but there there's are, no other treatment of death in philosophy of right, and I mean, I know it's no. not in logic or no. No. But okay, to clarify, so you're, right. you're right. It's not a major part of his. I mean, I would say it is the major part, but it doesn't get a philosophical elaboration in the way that you're absolutely right. Heidegger, more than any other thinker, I mean, if you said to someone just off the street, who's the philosopher of death, they would say it's Martin Heidegger, right? Because he has this real uh, uh, concrete passage where he's just dealing, even though later he, he kind of doesn't. The discussion of death later on, when he's talking about the forgetting of being, they're pretty, they're not, I, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, right? So it's really, to it's confined in a certain part of his thought, but it is there. I mean, the only thing I would say, another thing I would say about the difference is, in the case of Hegel, it, it seems to me, even though we've named these two little places where it is, it seems to be informing everything that he thinks whereas i'm not sure that you could say that about the later heidegger like maybe you could and maybe people would want to say that um well i I, mean, I think about like it, it when he when he goes over to the fourfold he starts referring to us as mortals and so yeah, maybe yeah. in the background of the fourfold you, you've got yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Think and i think there's a, for original there's even mikey there's i mean david probably knows this better than anybody but there's even a reading of the carré the turn that sees it like he's already like it's rooted in the later philosophy is rooted in being in time. It's not actually a turn away from that. I mean, I don't know if that's. I know that's a reading. I don't know if that's the one that's the the doxa today. But I think you could say that. But anyway, the, uh, that, that that I would I would I would, without being super, super. See, that's the whole the question of the turn could be its own course, you know. But I, For sure. I, my operating assumption while reading this has been that that is the case, and that I think one of the big motivations between saying that the turn is an abandonment of, say, being in time, is because people like to think of being in time as this uh, radical existentialist individualist project, as opposed to we all know in 1933 he's very big on the collectivity. Uh, in, in in the worst way possible, right? And then that just right. spir- you know, and that 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 goes for another ten years for him. And then he has his mental break while he, he's he's like going through the denazification process. He has his mental break. He's in a, a a psych ward for something like three months, and then he comes out and he publishes the letter on humanism. This is all seen as like this big uh, change. I I don't I don't I definitely don't think that there's a change here because I I don't yeah, think that okay. being in t- I don't think that being in time uh is an a radical individualist existentialist text and right, i think I that I, know, you know. I think that chapters <sighs> one th- i think chapters one through three are his summary of the radical existentialist individualist position that he is imminently critiquing and he you you get that imminent critique in the last three chapters of division two and so we're actually getting to chapter three uh this saturday uh, in the course and so but that's a whole other thing. And honestly, for now, let's just bracket out my reading and just go with sure. what we're saying, which is just that for him, death is this uh, this individualizing thing. 
right? Because it obviously individualizes you from the they. Uh, I would then say yes, but for your own most potentiality for being in the world, which there's this cultural aspect to it, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to bring it back to you saying that that individualizing sense, this more existentialist way of taking it, is related to uh, the way he uh, Hegel's doing it. So this antinomy that Brent Adkins is talking about between the individualizing and the communal uh, kinds of negation uh, through death, uh, you're, how, are, how are they? Yeah, Going I just don't see again? where I, I I would just ask where in Hegel is death communal. I just don't. I mean, I just he, don't see that. He said it was through religion. I don't. Does anyone remember better than me what Atkins actually said when he said that it had to do with religion? Sorry, I didn't see it, Dave, so I can't. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, he was. It, I, I mean, yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like, that's why I'm, I was curious. Like, okay, I don't know if Brent is relying on um, master slave dialectic for it, where it, the question of how religion processes death, I, Hegel. I mean, death is significant in Christianity for Hegel, but it's not in, it's not the individuals. It's the death of God. Hey, right? like that seems like well, a different like thing. Yeah, I mean, that seems like like it's the death of the God of the beyond. I mean, that is absolutely central to Hegel's thinking, but I don't think it's some kind of like synecdoche for everyone's death that Christ, I mean, Christ does stand in for everyone for Hegel, but not, the death is is not everyone's death. It's the death of, it's the death of the God of the beyond, right? Like through Christ's death, God comes down to earth and is now in the community of believers. I mean, that is, that just seems like to me that's ABC of Hegel, right? Like that, and that's why that's the, the why religion, especially Christianity, is so integral to his thinking, right? Like that that what Spinoza thinks is just sort of a natural condition that God is in everything. Like Hegel thinks, no, God is God is this transcendent beyond that has to through this act of 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 Christ's death comes to inhabit the what he calls the community of that's just his term the community of believers or what we might call like the symbolic structure uh so i yeah i don't think that it's i don't think that that's that in religion for hegel that that is some kind of like collective death i just don't i mean except in the sense that it's like it's how we're pro like religion is for him how we process what we don't can't make sense of right like this absence within the within our existence this what's what what doesn't fit right that's Hegel. that's what Hegel. Well, that's, that's less what, Hegel and just more religion in the right history. i mean right i don't think that's a, right that's no great hegelian insight that is just what religion talks about right 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 all right well follow was that your fault was that your follow-up there mikey or do do yeah, is it my, is it my turn question, but well, I guess uh, my mine is uh, potentially related, it, Mikey. If you think it's going to take us too far afield, you can always uh, say, "Hold on, no, let's get this one in there first. And mine is about the idea, and I, Brent had touched on this, that the Lacanian theory, and also, I mean, I guess D and G, they're talking about Freud in Anti Oedipus. They're not talking so much about Lacan in every case. Um, they say it's true. It's true. It's it is the situation. Everything is that applies. This is true, but then their move is to say it's not this trans historical, universalized, all time truth, and that it is a product of a specific historical context, and um, that that it therefore can be overcome, or that there might be other ways of going about things, um, and so. That's that's for me. I guess the big question is, and I, I have a follow up to it, maybe for later if we get to it, if we have time. But that the main question is just to kind of address this idea that um, Freud just trans historicized. Yeah. Well, I just want to say because I, I, I want to let Todd riff on that, but I just want to say this idea that hey, Oedipus is not trans historical; it's culturally and historically. Lacan says that in the Acree. Like, Lacan knew that. And so, I'm just saying, like, Lacan was already there before they said that. 
Yeah, I think I just would just underline what Mikey just said. I mean, I think Lacan's like, and Deleuze and Guattari was a he was at the seminar, right? So, I mean, it's not like he was just coming at Lacan externally. Eventually, he distanced himself from Lacan, but I don't think that in anti Oedipus, at least in the first volume, that they are. Even Deleuze, I don't think they're thinking they're making an anti-Lacanian point. I th- and I'm not even sure. I mean, it's anti-Freudian to some extent, but it's much more, I think, targeting the practice of psychoanalysis, right? And I think there are a lot of people who, I mean, Aaron Schuster, for one, you know, this book, The Trouble with Pleasure, he would be an interesting person to have on here for this very discussion because he thinks that they're utter, he comes from the Lacan side, but he thinks they're utterly reconcilable, those and and Lacan. So, so uh, there you go. Mikey has it. So, so th- I, I think that it's there is there is a position that that thinks this, and I think that the, that one of the things that Lacan does well to Freud is that he, uh, Mikey was saying this, dethrones the Oedipus complex to I think highlight the castration complex and he thinks of castration in a he would say freud was already thinking this but i don't think that is true he makes castration into symbolic castration and then like if that's the background at which in any kind of like oedipal relation comes about then well then oh the oedipal relation is just it's just a contingent this is what mike was saying like a contingent historical manifestation of the way in which people deal with symbolic castration, right? And the way it gets, uh, you know, manifested in the, in the nuclear family, but it doesn't like, there's no attachment to that, right? There's no way, there's no belief that that's somehow like this matrix that has to be always operative. Right. So I think that's a, yeah. No. So, okay. Two things. One is I I think the most anti Lacan point they make, and, and maybe there's others, and I'm this is just the one that always stuck with me. They have this image in Anti Oedipus uh, where they're saying, "Look, if if you blow up a bridge and the bridge just falls back into place, what have you really done?" I mean, that's I'm paraphrasing, but their point is okay. It's a it's a jab at Lacan because if you if you blow up the content of Oedipus, oh, it's not actually the biological mother. It's not actually the biological, but if, if Oedipus, you blow all that up and then the frame, the structure falls back and performs the exact same function, you haven't done anything for them. And yeah, so I good. think yeah. your critique is like, who gives a shit if you de-biologize Oedipus, if ultimately the exact same functions play themselves out, nothing's changed. And right, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say, agreed. I don't even disagree with that. Like, I think, but I think that I mean, part of it is, I think you have to really think of the difference between Lacan's thought early on and before the seminars and in the early seminars and then in the middle seminars and then late. Because I think once he develops the objet on and phallus kind of loses its importance so uh meaning of the signification of meaning of the phallus is 1960 right like after that time the phallus kind of like drops out and so it doesn't matter it's not so much even if it's symbolic phallus or or real or like actual father right like i think it just that's just not important for him because what's important for him is this object ah, that's driving our desire that can't fit that is this piece that doesn't fit within the symbolic structure. And I think his response to what Deleuze and Guattari say would be, well, how are you accounting for what doesn't fit within the symbolic structure? Right? Like, I think that's the real, that seems to me where the rubber hits the road for at least the Lacan of this middle period. And, and, not, but I think the, it seems to me like their critique is perfectly valid for Lacan up to seminar seven, up to up to nineteen sixty, and then after that, I think it doesn't do that. It doesn't just bring the bridge back. It's actually like completely re. 
formula. So, and so I guess my second point, and this is where this is almost the point where it's like, this is why I'm a Lacanian, Zizekian, Magawian, and not a Deluzo Guatarian. It's right at this point, which is this. Okay. So if the problem is that there is this spontaneous life affirmative type of desire called desiring production, which is all about parts of the body connecting to other parts of bodies, other aspects of the world. And it's this kind of playful experimentation. And that's the fundamental structure of desire. And, and I mean, this, I, I, I elaborate on this, this mega post that I've been working on forever. It is going to come out relatively soon. And I, this is, I finally kind of just analyze this point that I've always made about D and G. I think Deluzo Guatarians, when I say this, some of them will go, that's a straw man argument, but I don't think it is. So here's my thought, which is, okay, if you want the the free flow, free flow of desiring production, just pure experimentation, no social mediation by the law, by prohibition, nothing, then the new earth that they talk about is going to be a society where somebody just walks up and jams their fingers in your mouth because their fingers spontaneously want to connect to your mouth. This does not make social cohesion possible. There has to be certain protocols in place for us to not be pure aliens. I know we always have this excess of the real in each other and I don't know your unconscious and I, you don't know mine and I don't know mine and you don't, Yes, yeah. but it's just this generic fabric of Dosmon or the big other that makes us able to relate at all. And right. it is rooted in prohibitions. And whether they like it or not, those prohibitions facilitate social cohesion. And this this fantasy of just completely non-mediated connections of bodies connecting to other bodies I'm sorry, the, the very idea of consent has prohibition at the heart of it, which is to say there are certain things I do not want to happen to me. And if the idea is, oh, you know, it's a it's a fallacy of desire to act like desire has to take whole people into account. It's just part oriented. You and I know that some of this is true because of partial objects and all that. Right. But nevertheless, we don't want to let. You don't have a society where you don't have people relating to each other as whole persons who have whole networks of what they would or would not want to happen to them. And the point is, if you're going to be part of this social fabric, you are not allowed to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. That has to be barred. And that is symbolic castration in the purest sense. So you don't have if by the new earth you mean some sort of society where desire can flow, you don't get a society like like they're they're mutually contradictory. Where you don't get a society where there's no prohibitions placed on your desiring production. If you want a meaningful social order to exist in any way, shape, or form, I don't care how anarchistic or uh, uh, anarchist you want it to be or how libertarian you want there are still certain protocols in place that are enforced for us to navigate our interactions with other people and if you don't have that you don't have society and so i you know i think all of it just breaks down and that if you want any type of social order whatsoever prohibition is always going to be at the heart of it totally agree i think that i, I mean i i you know this you know this uh this example Lacan gives in seminar 11, where he says, I'm in, you're in a Chinese restaurant, you know, and the menu's in Chinese. And you say to the waiter, you don't say, how do you translate the menu? You say, what is it I should want here? Right. And I think, isn't that, that seems to me to be exactly what you're getting at, that you don't, not only would you not be able to get along with the other, to the extent that we do get along with the other, uh, but you couldn't even know what you wouldn't even have a way to desire, right? Like that's like, like the, the, and I think this comes down to, I think the one of the real keys of, of the way of thinking about this opposition between Deleuze and Hegel or Lacan is that is around the idea of representation, right? Like, like that, 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 and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Because the law is always intimately linked to representation and that can you, can you, 
like I think the idea for them is can you find a way to, to can we imagine a social order without this burden of representation, right? And I think for you've just shown all or described all the ways that you couldn't do that. But I think that that even would be like the burden is even on our desire itself, right? Like you could you wouldn't even you wouldn't even be able to ask that question, what is it I should want here? And okay, you can think your desire is going to emerge spontaneously, but even, this is what I would say, like, do you know this movie by Francois Truffaut called uh, L'Enfant Sauvage? It's about about a real, it's, it's called The Wild Child, and, and it's translated. Uh, but it's about a real, this the real kid, guy, that existed outside of, didn't speak, existed in nature. Feral so child. Like age, yeah, the feral child, right. Uh, and, and, he never really could make the adjustment, right? He couldn't really. Then they say, if you don't learn to speak by the time, I don't know what it is, like eight years old, but you never really, you never really can, can get it. And he could never really speak. Uh, and, but the point is, he didn't even know, he didn't have any, like all this spontaneous, he didn't have any of it, right? He was just like, he was just trying to eat and survive. So, my it, it, the feral child is a completely, utterly traumatic image of it, that's what you get if you have somebody who's not entered the realm of prohibition, big other, all and of symbolic, all the baggage right, that right, comes with it. Right, right, exactly. And I think the point is that that there's no spontaneous vitality to that feral child, right? Like there's no, there's none, and and it's only in like even though the kids seem to be doing it on their own. They're always saying, like, look here, look what I'm doing. Like, I remember my kids, they always did that. They're climbing up in a snow fort. They're like, look at the snow fort. It's amazing. Okay, it's spontaneous, blah, blah, blah. It's about the snow and this love of the natural world. But why are they turning around and saying, look at what we did? That's it. I just said, that's to me my, that's my, just my, and I think that's what you're. I said that today. I was thinking that exact point, which is, Brent, you, you, you're you observing your kids. They spontaneously play. But don't they look over their shoulder at you? Like, look, I'm happy. I'm enjoying for you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Like, they're trying to show us what spontaneous vitality is. So it's not spontaneous vitality. Right. right? It's like, it's like, like the, to the me, strawberry cake. Me, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The strawberry cake. Exactly. Uh, can you want to maybe after I'm going to say a little thing and then describe that because it's worth talking about. So. Little story. So uh, the best biography I've ever read of a philosopher is Ray Monk's biography of Wittgenstein. It's a, it's just amazing. It's like a really good analysis of Wittgenstein's work. And too many of these philosophical biographies are about the cultural history. And like, no one, you don't give a shit about that. You want to know about the philosopher her himself. And he does that. But one of the things he says is Wittgenstein was watching. So he had two brothers that were piano prodigies. Hans, who died pretty when Wittgenstein was really young. And then Paul, his brother Paul, who uh, Ravel wrote the one-handed, left-handed piano concerto for his, for Wittgenstein's brother. So it's a kind of a story. Uh, he lost his, uh, he lost his right-handed uh, World War One. But anyway, he saw his brother Hans, the older one, who committed suicide, uh, playing the piano and was just was so absorbed in his the genius of his piano playing that nothing else mattered for him. And Wittgenstein said, you know, I want to have something where I'm like that, where I'm totally absorbed in a thing just spontaneously. And I can't, and then he became a philosopher like that. And then people would watch him walking around Oxford and they'd be like, you know, he's just so spontaneously involved in his own thought. He can't think of anything else. He doesn't care about the other. But then of course they were wrong because he's modeled it on what he saw his brother doing. So like, it's all about the other from the beginning, right? And so I think that's the, like, you could look at that and say, oh, Wittgenstein, that's what is the model of subject. He was kind of autistic. So there, I think there's a certain parallel to this uh, disconnection with the other. But uh, uh, you could look at that and say, oh my God, like that's the model for subjectivity or we wouldn't even call it subjectivity for like, uh, whatever the body without organs even right like uh but you would miss the way in which it is a subject it is someone who's referenced to the other anyway bring up the strawberry thing because i think that's really 
Well, yeah, so uh, the the original example comes from Freud himself, if I'm not mistaken, right? Who misreads it? That's right, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, okay, there's a little girl, and she she reports- Anna Freud. It's his son, it's a daughter. daughter. Who is it? It's Anna Freud. It's Freud's daughter. It's younger Okay, so Anna Freud has this little dream when she's a kid, and it's a dream of her eating strawberry cake, right? And so the easiest way to go- with this interpretation is oh well see it's wish fulfillment she she desires to have strawberry cake she's eating strawberry cake and that's what freud says he says yes children's wishes are are completely unambiguous like they just they they see a thing they want and they they or their dreams are unambiguous they see a thing they want they have that wish and then they dream exactly and and here's it's the problem of, it's kind of on this dng side almost like it's yeah. okay it's a representation but it's a representation of pure spontaneous desire Right. which is non other mediated desire right. right well of course uh now is it did G, did slavoy get it from lacan or is this slavoy in play no, no it's slavoy's own, own idea it's slavoy's it's play, own. Uh, it's slavoy. okay so in plague of fantasies slavoy goes to work analyzing this dream and the whole point that when you get into it is that she doesn't spontaneously desire strawberry cake for herself it's how she it's how she interprets the other's desire oh to make mommy and daddy happy, I have to be the little girl who enjoys eating strawberry cake that they give me, right? So her being happy- and, and it's prohibited, right? Like it's a per, it's not like she can't just have it for dinner, right? That's the other part of it, right? Exactly, right? So basically, Slavoj does this Lacanian reading of the dream that fleshes out the uns- the uh, the background or the unspoken dimension of it, and the point is, it's completely other oriented, right? Now, here here's the thing now. Deluzo Guitarians won't like this, but here's how I figure it. I think DNG, because of the whole philosophy, the Spinoza thing, because we are fundamentally lacking beings, if we are at our core lacking, then the egg, which that's Deluzo's way of talking about reality as one imminent whole, right? The Spinoza substance, right? If we're lacking and we're part of it, then the the egg is lacking. There's a gap in the egg. Now, it's a whole other thing to say, well, is the egg itself lacking? That's the real Zizekian move. But let's just say that, okay, all objects are pure substances, right? They're not lacking, but humans are. Okay, desiring production then is a way of filling in the void, the lack, in the other, which is the egg. They have to fill in us with pure positivity in order to keep negativity out of the imminent egg, the imminent one, the, the pure substance, right? And so ultimately, I think this move is a is almost rooted more in fantasy than philosophy. They're going to not like that at all, but that's where I'm at with it. Why? There is a stubborn insistence with DNG on this pure positive, no negativity, no negativity. And you, I can't help but kick into psychoanalytic mode. Why, even if what you're saying is right, you're sure being pathological about negativity here. What's your deal? Why, why is it such a, oh my God, no, not negativity. There's a weird reaction. And I'm sorry, like, I love Brent's work. But he even, you saw him do that today with negation or negativity. It's like a, a, a like an immediate visceral no, not to that, right? Um well, so that's, there's something ironic about that, isn't there, Mikey? Like you can't say, like you can't say no to negation because you are. That is an act of negation, right? Like it's just. I mean, it's. I mean that which I think doesn't it come to the whole issue, which is, is that a return of the repressed innocent? Right, I think so. Right, I think so. But but isn't the whole issue like why did the, why did we ever get off kilter in the first place? And I think that's the question to Spinoza, like. Why did we ever misrecognize this oneness in the first place, right? And he and I don't think he has a good answer for that, right? Like, because I don't think he can. Like, I think to answer it is already to introduce the negative. The problem is, of course, that 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 the way that Hegel and Lacan think about signification is that it and Sartre too, by the way, who's also in the background of who Deleuze is fighting against. I think um, that to speak is already to negate. Right, like to speak is to negate. So you're bringing negation in once you articulate a system 
in any way at all. I mean, this is Coach Ev makes this incredible point about Spinoza. He says, the Spinoza system is perfectly correct, except no one could ever articulate it. And so then you're like, well, okay. That kind of like, it, it sort of undermines the whole thing because you, like, I I remember this. Uh, so I was at a, I, I probably told this story to you guys even before, but I was at a conference one time, a psychoanalysis conference, and a, a, a guy who was a quasi friend of mine gave a talk in which he said, he denounced every conference presentation as perverse, a perverse acting out. <clears throat> and so I just, you know, I'm in the audience, I'm just feeling, I guess, prickish. I just raised my hand. I'm like, well, where did you give this talk from? I said, were you out in the courtyard or did, were you actually in the thing? And so you yourself are, you see what I'm saying? Like, I think that that's a problem for the critique of negation. Like where, where are you giving that critique from? And I think that's the, yeah. I was going to say also that it's interesting because you know, with Hegel, it's, you know, you have determinate negation. Well, that's, that's positive. That's the, to me, like, that's a positive kind of thing. And same with uh, the null basis of the nullity in Heidegger, you know, like, the, what, what is the null basis of the nullity? How does the nothing not, not, or whatever, you know? Well, right, right, right. it's because when you don't do something, when you, when you choose something positive, you have also then chosen all against doing all of those other things that you're not doing. It's like, and, and really it's like coming to terms with the fact that you've been thrown into a life where you were never really actively choosing your life. And at some point you have to take over your life. And, and, and when you take over your life, part of it is coming to terms with the fact that it's like, well, it's my life, but I didn't really choose it. How does that work? I don't know. But from now on, I have to choose and choosing is always negating. And so it's like, right. I just, I just don't understand how we could talk about the human and not talk about that. And I wish I totally I wish agree. I, but, totally but, agree. But this I wish I, I wish I I wish I could have asked Brent that. I don't want to act like this is some kind of a gotcha on Brent. I want to send this to Brent so that he can watch this conversation, so that we can hopefully resume and have a follow up conversation. Once uh, but, but I will David, have definitely is it, is it even, looked at like, his book to be soon. Fair, is it even possible? Like I think Mikey was kind of getting at this. Like I think aren't there certain. And again, Aaron Schuster would not like what I'm about to say, but he's a friend of mine. But I think, like, isn't it impossible for certain positions to even have a dialogue, right? Because, like, if you don't think, like, if you, like, I think, wouldn't he have to say that what you're saying about uh, life, right, like life choices, he's like, I think he would have to say, well, you're misrepresenting what's really going on. You're not negating other possibilities you're just carving out your own positive path, right? Like, I think, I think, in, like, like for Deleuze, like, uh, let me just get, like, let's, let's come back to death because it's kind of interesting, right? So Hegel thinks, Mikey, this is another, I forgot about this. This is another place where he talks about death. He's talking about the organism. He says that every organism contains its own death within it, right? It's kind of, it's nice, I think. Completely anti deleuzean Right, like for Deleuze, death is only, ex it's a, I think he says this in the Practical Philosophy book, like death is only a, is the result of a bad encounter, right? So it's a, no, no, or no entity dies of its own, on its own, by, on, on, by itself, right? It's always just, you get it, like, I'm going along, I encounter pancreatic cancer, I'm dead, right? Like, but, but there's not a, it's not like within me, I contain the seeds of my own destruction, right? Like that is not, but that is, that to me. So my question is, is there a way, like, I almost think you can't have a conversation. Like you can't, I, like I, I say this to Mikey all the time, like you just have to make a choice. Like, like either you, you know, think. You know, you're being right here. You're being very, and it's a guy we don't talk about much. You're being very La Ruellian, which is there's a fundamental decision a philosopher has to make about how they fundamentally bifurcate the world because every philosophy involves some fundamental distinction or or gap. And La Ruelle would just say that's the core of a philosophy is a fundamental decision. And if if Deleuze makes the fundamental decision that there is no negativity at the basic metaphysical level, that it's some epiphenomenal thing, and we say negativity is at the very core of being, 
I mean, I I mean, we could, I guess we could maybe try to argue it, but if that's the core fundamental decision, then everything that we do, ethics, epistemology, uh, aesthetics, they're all going to take on a different meaning if we're rooting being in the negative or whatever. So, right. No, it's absolutely correct. And I think like, don't you think that, like, I think Hegel believes that he's proving for, for the reason that David was saying that the negative exists, right? Like that, that, that there is, that that there's, that, uh, that, that contradiction is actual. And he thinks he proves it by the fact that we're talking right now. Like that's his, that's all his proof is. It's like, he's a very, he's very Kantian in that way. Like Kant's like, how do we know what has to be? Well, let's look at what we're doing and what makes it possible to do what we're doing. And then we know what has to be true. And I think that's how Hegel, that's how his proofs operate. It's not logical proofs. It's just proofs like what, what is, what has to be true for us to be able to do what we're doing right now. Would there be any philosophical discussion if we were all in the realm of the forms? We wouldn't discuss anything. No. It's because no. we don't live in a world of pure positive identity that we're having to discuss and debate things because things aren't immediately identical to themselves and knowledge is not immediately identical to being. There's right. these knots. Knowledge and being are fundamentally related, but they're not identical. Well, then why? how do they relate? Um, and the very, like, so I don't know. I feel like the only way to have pure positivity would be, uh, it would be a world without thought in a sense. Right. Right. Or, or the belief that the negative is a massive fantasy, right? That it's just this massive myth. But then of course that just begs the question of how the fantasy or the misstep emerges, which is, I think the entire point about, I mean, that's in a way Hegel's entire philosophy is like, how did the, even if it's a misstep, how does this, how does what uh, Spinoza is trying to correct, how does that even emerge as a problem, right? Like, how does this, how does this world of appearances even emerge, right? And that's the, but I think you're right. Like, the, 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 to even have that positivity, you need the, you need the, I, I think it's very hard to argue against that. But. Well, I, I hate to cut this off right here. I really do, because I want to ask like six other questions. So Todd, I hope that we'll be able to have you back uh, for the next round. I don't know, next month David, or something anytime, like that. Anytime, man. It's always my pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Mikey, what a, great what a, seeing you. Nance, what a pleasure. Excellent. Great to see you. And uh, just, I, I guess my, my final note on this would be, even if there can't, even if there are going to be irreconcilable, irreducible um, positions that uh, between, for instance, Deleuze and Lacan, um, and, and then the question is, well, can we really have a dialogue? I would say pedagogically we can, at least, at the bare minimum. Totally agree. So for, totally for, agree. For, I, 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 can I just yeah. say one thing about this? Yes. I think you, one you, of the we'll best, give you the last word. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't want the last word. <laughs> it's really tame. But one of the best little exchange, and I don't know if it helped other people, but it helped me quite a bit was I had this little exchange. It was like, no, it wasn't little. It lasted for like over two hours with Graham Harmon. And it really forced me. And I think this is where, what you're getting at. Like it forced me to really articulate what my position was in a way that was made it clearer to me than it had been just when I'm writing along on my own. So I think, I think, I think you're right that in that sense, there's a, a real pedagogical, pedagogical, sorry, benefit to the, the impossible dialogue, right? Can I just, uh, so here's the thing. When I was young studying this stuff on my own, I was drawing from all these secondary sources. And so for Heidegger, William Blattner, Hubert Dreyfus, Richard Capa Bianco, Thomas Sheen, right? With Lacan and Zizek, Todd, Bruce Fink, so right, so on down the line. With DNG, Brent Adkins, Henry Somers Hall, like there's a whole this is what's so special about what you're doing, Dave. To have Todd McGowan and Brent Adkins on the same stream, I think it, it's just an invaluable resource. And, th and that's the thing, Todd. Like, and last week he had William Large on. He's the guy who taught us Levinas. He wrote an incredible commentary on totality and infinity. The thing with academia, and you you guys all know this so well, if you become a Lacanian Zizekian, you're over here. If you become a Deleuzian, you're over here. If you're a Heideggerian, you're over here. But for us, 
who aren't in academia, we've drawn from all of you guys. All right. of you are, are teachers in some indirect way. And right. so that's what is so cool. Like, that's why we want to facilitate these kind of conversations and everything, because just today, having him on and then having you, I feel like I've learned something new or something that has been really clarified, right? Um, and that's what's so important about this is we want the best minds working in these areas of philosophy to dialogue with us and to dialogue with each other because, my God, look how much clarity is brought to the fundamental issues where if you're just reading a book by D&G and you're just reading a book by Lacan, you're not going to get there. That's right. why you guys exist. We need great teachers. And when you take teachers who, who are the best at what they do in their area and you put them on a stream together and you got one of the best Levinasians, one of the best Lacanians, one of the best Deleuzians, it, it's something that I've never seen exist in the world. And so that's yeah. why I'm so like part of me, not even as somebody who knows Dave or whatever, like just as an outside uh, outside observer, so as somebody who loves philosophy and theory, I'd be so excited to find theory underground just for what's been happening today here. Yeah, totally agree. Totally. Agree. Yeah. Thanks for having right. me on, Dave. Thanks, Later guys. Talk. See you guys. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research, and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts, and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible is an excellent book. Who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book, a collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of The Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing, but first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to 
be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money. And with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon <laughs> and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. My way of giving back to everybody is by promoting everyone who is at a current tier to the benefits of the tier above them, as far as subscribers go, and also rolling out a new lower tier. And so check out the tier subscription setup and if you're not interested in taking the courses or what's being offered for subscribers and you want to support anyway, check out the Patreon. Finally, just stay tuned for more information on the tour in Europe during the month of May 2024 and the conference in Mexico during the last weekend of October 2024. If you want to be there, hit me up ASAP. Let's get talking because it's happening very soon. All right. Bye-bye.